From the Dallas On Air studios in beautiful Dallas, Texas, this is Fulfillment here on DallasOnAir.com. And now here's your host, the Mega Bomber, PJ Dunn, and the film samurai, Carlos Salinas. Good morning. morning, good morning, everyone. Yes, welcome to what is now the 14th episode of Fulfillment. 14. So what I have with me today is I have Carlos is actually in Austin. And so he's going to join us today by phone. So you will hear all of his comments on the phone. You will see absolutely zero of his facial expressions. So the pressure is on me to do his facial expressions as well as I know him and then do my facial expressions. Well, we'll, we'll default to his Facebook photo. It's fine. <laughs> well, we'll do that too. Well, hey, we thank you for joining us here for this journey as we talk about fulfillment. And what we thought about this episode that would be great would be to talk about the biggest releases during Labor Day weekend since that's what's about to come up. And so, Carlos, when you first thought about this or saw this come across the desk here that we were going to talk about this, what did you think about Labor Day films? Could you even think of any? Not right off the bat, but, uh, yeah, that's that's a traditional weekend for kind of not big summer releases, but, you know, kind of like the next level of releases. You know, usually horror films are – Usually released about that time. It's mm-hmm. it's John, the dump- mostly genre films. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. the dumping ground before Oscar season. It is, right. which creates <laughs> a very weird thing because you've got a bunch of movie houses that are saying we need to put our Oscar bait stuff out there, and at the same time, we have that genre called the Halloween genre, the horror genre, which is actually getting a little better. Saying no, it's our Oscar time really because we're going to show out. For October 31st. So, yeah, it's a very weird ground. And then we're coming right. off the, the summer, right. I guess, blockbuster, I guess, right. hangover. Plus, plus we're not getting the – plus, this is uh, the season before the Christmas movie, so all the family movies are on hold. That's right. So, yep. give it's us the horror, then give us Oscar rate, and then give us family movies. This is our time. <laughs> this is our time down here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Carlos, just for uh, interest, uh, I know folks that are watching that are big film samurai fans. Can you tell them why you're in Austin? Uh, I'm, I was helping my daughter move into her new place. So, yesterday, my son came up from San Marcos, and uh, we just moved. She just had some big items to – get from her old place to her new place and uh she's gonna kind of pack up slowly the rest just clothes and knickknacks and stuff so yeah it was we, we was a pretty good move really good she fed us nice lunch she made us nice gourmet <laughs> baked chicken brussels sprouts sweet potatoes nice. she's uh takes after her mom she's uh she's a she's a chef wow wow this morning i got i got waffles and iced coffee oh my god See, that's why he didn't want to come back to town, ladies and gentlemen. He was going to stay there and get that. That's what that is. Yeah, well, yeah, well there's no I such thing leave, as a good man. there's no such thing as a good here. Brussels sprout. I just want to say that for the record. <laughs> for the record. No such thing. Now you gotta save us there. Okay, so you won't eat that green, K Zach, but what kind of greens will you eat? Huh? I'll eat just about anything else, man. But Brussels sprouts, <laughs> they're the devil. Really? So you yeah. put Brussels so to you it's like Brussels sprouts. And then, of course, <laughs> Kevin Costner. Is they're, that right? They're, 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 what, they're barely <laughs> one step it. above Julia Roberts. Oh, Whoa. because at least Brussels Whoa. sprouts try. A vegetable <laughs> so bad, bacon can't save it. <laughs> Bacon wrapped Brussels sprouts. That sounds awesome. Oh. <laughs> You'd like to think so, and yet no. <laughs> Woo, boy, I tell you. <laughs> That's a pretty scary oh, thing. So for all the fans, we're going to go ahead and jump then into our first segment just to get it going for us this morning. And so, as you know, what we do, the Film Samurai and I, we sit back and we look at the movies that are coming out this weekend and perhaps maybe some of them will come out next weekend and we tell you what we think is our best pick of the week so we're going to go into now the picks of the week picky wiki 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 on top of that one so picks of the week let's start with this hang on, hang on. Mm-hmm. I gotta get that sound. you gotta get that sound there it is there it is. there's my wiki wiki and you guys wanted to hear that too so here we go <laughs> so for picks of the week the first candidate is a horror thriller slash somewhat comedy called Ready or Not. The second film is 
an action film. It's Angel Has Fallen, starring Gerard Butler, who you remember from 300. And then the last film in this category is a faith-based film called Overcomer. It's a drama. So let's start with Ready or Not. Film Samurai, what do you know about this film and what do you think of it? Ready or Not, uh, I've heard a lot talk about it. Uh, pretty pretty good feedback. People seem to are seem to be enjoying it. It's uh, kind of violent and, yeah, like you said, it's got comedy too. And it's got this new actress, Samara Weaving. She's kind of like a Margot Robbie lookalike. Mm. Blonde, blue-eyed. and uh, She seems to be taking on this kind of uh, horror genre. She was in this movie, What, The Babysitter? Yeah. Which was kind of a surprise. Kind of enjoyed that one. It's kind of neat. But the one I, I didn't like her in was the Happy Death Day, where she just kept waking up over and over and getting murdered over and over. And oh, that was her. She kind I... of solve her own murder. Yeah, I think, I'm pretty sure that's her, same actress. Okay, okay, yeah. Because I, I, I did see the first one of those. They made two of those, believe it or not. Yeah, I think we saw that together. Uh, yeah. three screen. <laughs> that's right, <laughs> that's we right. Like, yeah, this is pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this film is directed by uh, Matt Bernat Bernatelli Olpin. And I think he's, isn't he an actor first and then a director? So he's done, he's got a lot of acting credits, but then he's done a few movies as well. Um, the other actors here with Samara would be uh, Adam Brody and Mark O'Brien. So, and the McDowell's in this one, too. That's right. That's right. And so I, I'm not quite sure. So what do you think about that cast? Would this be – does this cast make you want to go see this film, or what do you think? Yeah, I'll go see it. Yeah. I, th I think I'll probably go check it out in the theaters. It looks fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, ready or not. Well, I like it. So the premise here is that there is this woman that's about to get married into this – family married to this man but there's one thing that they got to do first and there's a game that this family ritually plays and it's called ready or not so uh, apparently by mm. the trailers the family basically just says okay we have a huge mansion take off and run and then we're gonna go find you but what she doesn't know is they grab all these different weapons like there's a bow, oh. there's a bow caster there's an axe there's guns and what she doesn't know is that they're not just playing hide and seek. They're actually looking to do some damage. And so, mm. so that's what the trailer is showing. And so, but there's a humorous tune, uh, humorous tone to it as well, which is kind of funny. Cause like they show in the trailer, one of the family members is shooting for her and they miss and they kill their, uh, maid. <laughs> And that was where the humor came in. They, yeah. The maid gets shot. Incompetent upper crust, basically trying to learn how to use crossbows on YouTube. Yes. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, I got to say I'm in for this one. Absolutely. Okay. Without mm -hmm. question, Look man. at that. This is, this would be a good driving flick, right? Oh, totally. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I'm thinking that's probably pretty good. So this movie is an hour and 35, which is probably just right. An hour and 35 minutes. If it went on for two hours, it probably would lose some of its steam. But you know what? I, I'm okay with this film. I think this one might be all right for one of the picks. Let's look at the second one. And this is Oh, an, by the way, I was, yes. I was wrong about the Happy Death Day. It's just Garoth. Was the actress in that one? Okay, but they all look similar these days. <laughs> After right. yeah, They're yeah, like this interchangeable is... actresses. Blonde it's, and it's the poor man's uh, Margot Robbie, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the second film is actually a action film with starring, of course, uh, Gerard Butler, Frederick Schmidt, and a guy that's in Yellowstone as a villain, Danny Houston. And this yeah. is Angel Has Fallen. This is two hours and one minute. This is the longest of the movies, but this is not bad at all. So what do you know about Angel Has Fallen? Uh, the sequel to, to, to I, I think there's been two before this one, right? That, what was that's the correct. Original called? The first one was called uh, um, Olympus Has Fallen. Olympus Has Fallen, mm -hmm. okay. But he's saving the president. Morgan Freeman is the president. Yes. And uh, yeah, Gerard Butler, Secret Service. Mm -hmm. And this time he gets framed for trying to kill the president so he's got to go on the run and then he enlists the help of his dad played by nick nolte yes playing like yeah he's chewing up the scenery for sure he old grizzled grizzly bear looking guy and he he i guess uh gerard butler's character learned a lot from his dad because it seems like his dad was like special forces or something he knows a lot about explosives and dynamite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he helps uh, helps his son out. 
Yeah, so this is the classic case of the hero becomes the fugitive. And uh. from the trailer, what we see is, and that, that's exactly right. So from the trailer, what we see is a, a Morgan Freeman who's playing the president who's out on his, his boat. And these drones come into attack, and because Gerard Butler's character, I think his name is Stanning or something, um, he saves the president by them jumping into the water, but everyone else dies. And so this makes them think, well, that's kind of strange. All your men die except for you. Maybe. <laughs> and so it kind of goes from there, mustache twirl, wink, 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 as we look into the camera and break the fourth wall. <laughs> so there we go. We have Gerard Butler. So what do you think about Gerard Butler's career? This might be interesting to talk about because he started pretty strong. Everybody loved him in 300. Everybody went to go work out to try to get abs like that, uh, to which then Thor would then change that in Endgame. But um, what do you think of this guy's career, movie choices and all that? Um, you know, he's, he's been in kind of every type of movie almost like he's even done like comedy. Yes. Like he did a J Jennifer Aniston movie, the bounty. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Bounty hunter. That's what Bounty hunter. And he's even voiced, you know, uh, animated character and how to train your dragon. Mm -hmm. He was in that hunter killer. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, he's mostly he's now he's getting, seems to me typecast these big action thriller you know where he's yeah geopolitical uh, world you know takes place all over the world traveling mm. around mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it's getting kind of generic uh yeah he's i like the guy i mean yeah i, I, I mean even in uh what he was he wasn't he the phantom in phantom of the opera the uh yes the with, um, he was right so he so he so he's like a singer too so he I, i'm pretty sure he sang his own stuff in that yeah that movie so so when, you can't afford hot, so when you can't afford Hugh Jackman, you get Gerard Butler. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and you know, and it's interesting because he was also in that movie The Ugly Truth, and that was a romantic comedy. And I was, mm -hmm. I know that actors have to stretch and try to do different things, but sometimes you just yeah. can't break the mold of seeing them from one thing to the next unless they're just really, really good. And I don't know that he's mm -hmm. ever done that, but hopefully maybe this one will kind of bring him back a little bit because uh, I think he has kind of uh, dissipated just a bit. So, uh, yeah. yeah, and so that so this film, yeah, I um, think this one, his, this one has like a built in audience, yes, by now because you know they're familiar with the other two, and so it's going to give them more of the same, uh, yeah, he's not in action, and <laughs> yeah, and hey. I think these are pretty violent, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I think he's the one guy that's not in The Expendables that's been in action roles. I think he's the only right. one. <laughs> well, let's look right. at the last film that rounds out our picks of the week. And this is actually Overcomer, which is is a drama, but it's it's also a faith-based movie. It's an, it's an hour and 59 minutes, so it's clocking right there with Angel Has Fallen. Um, and so the director here is Alex Kendrick, and his brother is also the co-writer. So the Kendricks brothers are the ones who did uh, facing Gi the Giants, and I think Fireproof, and then of course the biggest faith-based film ever that actually was number one for a long time, which was War Room. So they're back now with this film, and, and here's the synopsis of this film, which I actually really want to see this because between all the superhero <laughs> movies and the action flicks and the horror films, you kind of have to have some of these. And so the the synopsis here with Overcomer is there's this guy, it's a coach, he's kind of burning out, he's got one last move, they decide to kill some of the football and basketball programs. The only thing he can do is be a track coach or a marathon coach. But the only problem is that this high school, there's only one kid that even wants to be on the team, and it's a girl who has asthma. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he's ready to quit wow. and throw it all in, but it's like but this is his challenge. And so it ends up being one of those heartwarming stories about what happens when a plant and the city shuts down and all these kids, parents, get laid off. And so the parents can't afford to have them play football, basketball. And so the only thing that they can still fund, mm -hmm. the school can fund, is their cross-country, you know, team. So yeah. You don't need a lot of equipment for it. You just need to yeah. running shoes. That's it. Yes. And so the right. film is touted as a film really being about the identity because, you're, you know, they're saying whatever you put your heart into it ends up becoming your identity. So mm -hmm. this girl has an identity in running, which we'll figure out once we see the movie, like why that's important. But we understand what the coach's identity is, is he's feeling like, well, who am I if I'm not coaching people, even if it's one yeah. person, even though that's not what he wanted right. at first. And even if it's not a sport, that's not very, you know, sexy. 
So, yeah. <laughs> so with this, you have uh, Alex Kendrick himself, the director and the writer, is actually playing the lead character. You've got Sherry Rigby and Priscilla C. Shire. Now, Priscilla C. Shire is a good local name here because that's Tony Evans's daughter. So Tony Evans is one of the Ooh. big pastors over there at at uh, Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship. So this is his oh, okay. daughter who's written several books and does a lot of uh, conferences that help you know, with, with women and their uh, understanding and their empowerment and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. she's in this, is probably like her third role. So nice. that's kind of interesting. So there's a little local connection to this as well. So here we go. Let's look at the picks. Which ones, will it be Ready or Not, the horror thriller slash comedy? Will it be Angel Has Fallen, the action film, unadulterated action film? Or is it the simple heart story, pull at your drawstrings, overcomer? We'll start with you, Carlos. Which one are you going to go see? Uh, definitely go, we'll go see Ready or Not. Gotcha. We'll go check that out. Ready sounds or fun. Not? Yeah, sounds like it'll be good. Popcorn movie. There you go. And Kazak, your pick? Oh, Ready or Not's already got my money, man. Ready or Not's got that money. And I'm going to say, just to be a little different, I'm going to go see The Overcomer. I just want to see a good story. I want to see how this pulls out, how this plays out. So... That's our picks for the week, ladies and gentlemen. You can go see any one of these, but this is kind of where we're heading. So with that, we're going to dive right into our segment two, which is Just Seen It. And there's that sound. When you hear that sound, do you know? So, Carlos, we'll start with you. What have you seen since we've last sat down and talked? Okay, the last movie I saw in theaters was The Nightingale. Oh, how was that? Jennifer uh, Jennifer Kent. It was very strong film. Uh, very um, tough subject matter, you know. This is a period film. It takes place in Australia. If you know the history of Australia, it, it originated as a almost like a penal colony for England. You know, they sent all their pretty much the worst of the worst, and just that was the island. You know, that was what was there. And uh, of course the there are English officers running things, and they are, as you can imagine, pretty cruel to not only the aboriginals, the people who are lived there their whole for centuries, you know, mm. but the prisoners as well. So there's this one particular officer, officer who's taking advantage of a woman. She's a new mother, and she's got a husband. But she's beholden to him because she was a convict and she served her time and she's trying to get him to send the letter to mm. the authorities to say, OK, she served her time. She can go back. She's originally from Ireland. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, the history between Ireland and England, there's that whole dynamic there. So uh, mm -hmm. things really horrible happen to this woman. And and from there, she enlists the help of this uh, local Aboriginal tracker and they're adversarial at first because there's the racism, you know, in mm -hmm. any, even if you're white, uh, English, Ireland, or what, you look at blacks almost like they're animals, you know. They're, right. She calls them, everybody calls them boy, you know, or mm -hmm. like dog, you know. They just, they just treat them terribly, you know. This is just awful, just systemic racism over the centuries. And, uh, mm -hmm. but over time, as they go on this, what happens is the officer does something horrible and then he takes off to take over a new position in another town. And once she wakes up from that trauma, she, she decides on herself that she's going to go find this guy and kill, either kill him or get back at him somehow. She hasn't really, you know, she's just enraged, you know, she's just got it in her mind. And uh, her friends warn her, you know, you can't just travel alone. You know, it's a dangerous territory. You know, it's, it's, they're going through woods and, and uh, you're going to either get lost or get killed mm -hmm. either by other people or animals or whatever. So mm -hmm. that's when she gets this uh, aboriginal. Uh, the performance by the two leads are um, incredible, man. And it's really, man, uh, near the end, it gets really like... Um, yeah, I don't want to give too much away. I just, sure, sure. I would. I, I definitely recommend it. Like I said, there's some scenes that are very uh, extremely violent and hard to watch. Uh, the, the the things that happen to this woman, and but over time you see how she gets more and more strong and you know powerful with herself. You know, just finding the strength 
to survive and also to just overcome what happened to her, you know, this, this trauma. So, um, yeah, I definitely recommend that that movie. Awesome. Shot very beautifully, this the scenery, and I, I'm assuming they shot it there in, in Australia. But it's not almost not the Australia you usually imagine a lot of like desert and uh, and uh, crocodiles, mountains and stuff. This is mostly <laughs> like almost like jungle, almost like a lot of forests. Oh my! Uh, so it's 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 not a dry, you know, gray. Uh, it's a lot of green, you know, birds and stuff. So gotcha. Uh, yeah, it's good, strong film. Uh, the other thing I saw in theaters was I went and saw the uh, Apocalypse Now final cut uh, in IMAX at the uh, North Park. Oh, wow, man. Nice. Uh, I, 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 I'll probably tell you a million times, this is like my all-time favorite film, so mm-hmm. I had to go see it again. You know, I hadn't seen it on the big screen since it came out in like, mm-hmm. 1979 at the old Inwood. That's uh, a 40-year anniversary. At, Highland, at the Highland Park Theater. So, yeah, it was the 40-year anniversary. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it was about the same time it came out. It came out in August. Um, so, yeah, it's Wow, I was just kind of blown away because not only just seeing it on the big screen, but it, uh, they added scenes I've never seen before. One particular scene that was actually really funny, and I, and I won't I won't spoil it. You just have to, you know, that yeah. you probably see it on, when it yeah. comes out on uh, Blu-ray. I, I like I pre-ordered the Blu-ray like months ago because yeah. I knew it was coming out. So. Uh, they still keep the old plantation scene from the Redux cut. Uh, the French plantation, so they they have that. They cut other parts out from that that cut. Um, but overall, yeah, it's it's just an incredibly timeless film. You know, I know it's Vietnam era, but mm-hmm. it's like the music, uh, the electronic score by Carmine Coppola and and Francis himself. I guess they co uh, yeah composed the, the the soundtrack. And of course, those iconic scenes. You know the the helicopter attack on the Vietnamese village and Robert Duval and uh, the, the performance of uh, Martin Sheen, you know, his, his uh, voiceover where they took the, uh, the from the book, uh, uh, that Michael Ayer book of Vietnam. Uh, incredible. Just, man, it's just like, I almost know that whole movie by heart. You know, it's just almost every line. It's just nice. it's great sequences and lines. So, so that nice. was, a, that was an experience. It was great. Just watch it again. And actually, like it was almost pretty full crowd. I was kind of surprised—not surprised, but kind of surprised. I didn't think a lot of people would come out for it, but yeah, yeah. even young people were there. Like, yeah. yeah. And I and I was wondering, like, if is anybody watching this for the first time? Like, wow, oh, I, I'm I almost sure kind of want to go back and see it for the first time. Yeah, because uh, that that movie kind of blew me away when I was a senior yeah. in high school, and that was the first time I realized, yeah. Movies can be more than just you know mindless entertainment. They can be actual art, and, you know, have a powerful effect. And uh, yeah, it stuck with me for for ages. You know, I've watched it dozens of times since then. But, yeah, uh, yeah, great, great, great film. Uh, Texas Theater made a big deal out of this one. Um, I think they even did like their <coughs> own uh, tr- rem- remix of Apocalypse Now filming uh, to get this film there. It's uh, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I think one of the that is, and they should because I mean, this film, if I understand it correctly, it took them two years to edit it because they had a, they had 1.5 million feet of film, is what yeah. I understand. So I, it took them two years and four different four editors to help them edit this thing down just so that this film could even be presented in a theatrical yeah. release, which is incredible when you think about that. And then when you think about the study, because at that time. Films were supposedly coming out saying this is the horror of war and supposed to be an anti-war piece, but this goes actually more into psychology, which goes <laughs> into more of the the heart of darkness inside of man, where they'll go. Yeah, and it becomes it more basically of a an ad- on that. adaptation of Joseph Conrad's novel Heart of Darkness. Yep. If you ever get a chance, watch the Heart of Darkness documentary about it. It's really, really good. Gives uh, you a lot of insight into the the, the story and the filming and all that stuff it's it's just fantastic uh yeah even Bart sheen had a almost had a nervous i think he had a, like heart problems you know like i had a heart attack while they were filming the movie was so stressful for him wow and that wow. scene and where he's in his hotel room and he punches that uh that mirror and like cuts his hand that was real that really happened and he just kept rolling you know uh, uh, francis just kept rolling film on it wow he's just, uh, looking at his hand and, 
wiping blood on his face. <laughs> yeah, they they went with it. But uh, yeah, and then you see all these stars. Harrison Ford's in it. You know, a little little scene at the beginning. And Lawrence Fishburne. And Lawrence Fishburne's so young. Yes. Man. He's like seventeen. I think he lied to Francis Coppola about his age. He said he was like older than what he actually was. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Harrison Ford. Clean. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you had what yeah. Robert Duvall shows up in it as well, right? Oh yeah, Duvall, man. Yes, that, that, that scene with uh, yeah, love the smell of napalm. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Da, 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 da. Scared mm-hmm. the slopes. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you had what's his, and you had Marlon Brando, the Godfather himself. Oh, Marlon Brando, of course. Yeah, Dennis Hopper, that American mm-hmm. photographer, just mm-hmm. Dean Dennis Hopper, basically, you know, yeah. kind of playing himself, you know, just rambling on about you know existential and <laughs> philosophy and, <laughs> and uh, yeah great 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 stuff yeah anything else yeah. that you saw or is that good uh television wise i finished season two of mine hunters and it was just as good as the first season okay some great moments in it they recreate some of the uh serial killers of that time especially uh son sam uh, mm-hmm. that guy that actor they found to play him it looked exactly like him and they even did charlie manson well, in one episode where isn't, yeah they interviewed him in prison yeah isn't the guy who yeah. plays manson in uh that season the guy who played manson once upon a time in hollywood yeah yeah exactly Same this time guy, he had a wow. beard though because he was at prison in the uh tarantino he, he was clean shaven and he was only in one scene so i think so yeah that's right <laughs> so, <man. laughs> but yeah great film uh they, they show how they caught the uh the Williams guy, the one who's doing the Atlanta child killer. That mm-hmm. was that time uh, mm. that they're, that they're telling how they tracked him down and how they captured him. Brilliant work by the FBI profilers, you know, yeah. figuring out how to, how to best catch this guy. They figured out he's going to be a single guy. He's going to most likely live with his parents. He's probably got a pet. And, you know, it's like, how do they figure this stuff out? But they were <laughs> dead on in everything. Man. Sure. Sure. Well, they, they don't yeah. they do not do anything stuff. new, those guys. They don't do anything new. They kind of have the same isolationist traits. Mm-hmm. And they do that kind of stuff. Right. And, and they don't kill. It's weird how, like, I one thing I found, you know, interesting was they don't kill across races. You know, they figured this black... It could have been the clan, you know. Everybody thought it was the clan, and mm-hmm. they said, "No, it's most likely a black person." Mm-hmm. They don't kill, or you know, they will kill their own race. They won't kill other races. You know, it's like, wow, how do they know? How do they figure that? And mm-hmm. What is the psychology behind that? Yeah, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, <clears throat> no, that's that's pretty interesting. Well, for mm-hmm. I didn't actually make it out to the silver screen to see anything here, but I was watching that small screen. So for the TV fans, we're there. And so what I wanted to do, because I've been talking about it, but uh, I asked Kazak today to go ahead and find the, the YouTube trailer for season two of Yellowstone. And we were just going to go ahead and play that trailer real quick. And so um, if you wanted to find it, Carlos, you could just look up season two of Yellowstone on your phone, look at the YouTube if you want to see the visuals. But okay. let's go ahead and play that now, and then I'll give you a little bit of a synopsis of season two. family and I find ourselves in an interesting situation. Can I help you? Looking for John Dutton. Oh, yeah? John Dutton. The walls are closing in on all sides. Why would he survive? Your father's ranch isn't a kingdom, and he isn't a king. Your family deserves to lose everything. There are wolves everywhere here. I'll run this valley. There's a war coming. You bet your ass it's coming. This is where change begins. With new partnerships. They will pull you, they will twist you, and tear you into tiny pieces. To beat her, I have to attack him. I have to play dirty. We're about to find out how big a role you play in this family, son. You understand what I'm asking? Loyalty. Morality. Not part of the equation for you. Right and wrong so far from this place, I don't think it factors in at all. This cannot be fixed. All the angels. 
angels are gone, son. There's only devils left. I'm telling you. I'm telling wow. you. Without exaggerating, wow. and I'm and I'm really not exaggerating here, but this is to me, and I've watched Breaking Bad all the seasons of that. This right there is right on par with this. This really is if you took the Godfather and put it on a ranch, but it's Taylor Sheridan who's ro who wrote this, and you know he's did, he did Sicario, he did Hell or High Water, but he's showing his 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 chops here of how to take <clears> themes <throat> and stretch them all the way out to this the far gone conclusion with the different personality types that he has there. So you have John Dutton here, who is Kevin Costner. He's the guy that's trying to keep this ranch together because it's been in their family for all these centuries. But it's on his watch that looks like it's about to fall apart. He has one son that gets punked out that because he's smart, so he's the lawyer's son that has no guts. Then you have the, the treacherous daughter who will who would who would kill anyone at, at any moment for any price just to say she did it and she loves it, and then she'd stick it in your face. Then you got one son who's just he's just he's a natural good guy but he'll do the right thing, whatever the right thing is. And he's very influenced by his dad as to what the right thing is to do. And he'll kill if that's mm -hmm. what he has to do. And that's the son, Casey Grimes, wow. you see there. So this is what you've got. So season two picks up. It's almost at the end, the conclusion. I'll just say this for you. If this isn't enough for you to want to check this out in season two, finally, some people come after Kelly Riley's character and the job they do to her, right? But, but unfortunately... What they tried to do to teach her as a lesson doesn't change her. It actually makes her worse. And now the makeup job oh, that they oh do on God. her face, it's actually even more harrowing to watch her now at, with her <sighs> face dismembered in the way that it is and still be a jerk because you can't, you can't get past her face and she's still doing dirt. And so it looks even more ominous because before she was pretty doing that crazy crap. Now she mm -hmm. looks like a monster while being a monster and didn't break at all, even though these guys tried to break her with the brutality of how they beat her. That mm. season two. <laughs> oh, man. Right? <laughs> so I, I got to tell you, I've watched this a couple episodes over and over again because I just couldn't believe the writing and how good that he hangs threads out there. And then Taylor Sheridan yeah. is good at bringing that thread back in and then paying it off for you. So unlike what we saw in The Last Jedi where threads were just put out there and you were wondering, well, how did this happen? Well, how did this person become this? And when did Princess Leia become, you know, Mary Poppins, right? Well, here, if he introduced a thread, he's going to use it and it will come mm -hmm. up. And so it's it's one of the best things on TV right now. I, I can tell you that. Yeah, sounds yeah. good. Yeah, the, uh, I think season one finally came out in Blu-ray. So I think I'm just going to pick that up and just plug it in and binge watch it over a weekend. Yeah, when you yeah. do, man, you let me know, man, and I'll come over. I'll bring the pizza or whatever, and I'll sit down with you and binge <laughs> you watch, watch it. All over you? All yeah, right. I'll watch some. I'll awesome. watch as far as it can go with it, you know. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because awesome. it great. is. It's like an event just like that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that yeah. is our just seen it, and we've tried everything we could to make sure that when the theater isn't happening, that we talk about what's happening on that small screen as well. So this week. For this episode, calling it the the Labor Day episode, we're going to get into segment three now. Yes, and for your pleasure and for ours, <laughs> we're looking at the greatest Labor Day releases. This is a four-day release on in an opening. We're looking from an opening perspective, the dollars that it brought in from an opening. We're, we've got the top ten movies of all time by box office receipts for that four day period when they opened. And so we'll start mm. at the bottom at number 10 and work our way up to number one. So this is all time greatest Labor Day releases. Number 10 is a romantic comedy, uh, ironically, called All About Steve. It was released in 2009 and it opened at 14 million. Um, I didn't watch this Damn. film. What did you think of this film, Carlos? All about Steve. Uh, I can't remember if I actually watched this. This is a Sandra Bullock and Bradley Cooper. Yes. Um, yeah, I think I did because she played kind of an, a very eccentric character. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't. I couldn't tell you much about it. <laughs> I just kind of remember that. Yeah, she played probably, crazy uh, Sandra Bullock. Sandra Bullock in her prime, but trying to. <laughs> 
stretch her acting muscles and doing something a little No such and... thing. <laughs> okay, Zach, you seem to have an opinion on this. What is up? No. <laughs> Sandra Bullock plays the same character in every movie, no matter in what. In every movie, movie right? Yes. Yeah, even, uh, even in... Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> 28 days Never crazy mind. drunk Never all mind. about steve crazy stalker blah <laughs> she's a great person she's just a one-dimensional actress yeah 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 no i can say even I, the blind man. side where she plays the mom oh that's horrible <laughs> <laughs> i love you zach you're hilarious <laughs> 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 well, Zach so, tells so, the truth. You do, and I love that. I love that Zach tells the truth. That's why we have monitors. Because sometimes we might fanboy out on something, but Zach puts us right back on track. Correct. That. That's yeah. see, see, correct. That's the, right. Brings us so, down there. Right. So would you? I, I'm interested though. I'm interested though, Zach. Is she the female Kevin Costner, or is that Julia Roberts? Oh no, no, no! no. Julia Roberts is the devil all knew herself. Actually, <laughs> Sandra Bullock really is the Kevin Costner because again, one-dimensional actor who mm -hmm. just plays the same character no matter what script you give him. <laughs> kind of like Will Ferrell, huh? He's another guy that does that. Yeah. Let's look at number nine. Number nine on this list of all-time greatest Labor Day releases is a film called Machete. came out in 2010, and it opened at about 14.102 million, so just a little bit better than All About Steve. What do we remember about this film, anybody? I love this. TJ, film. you gotta you gotta use the Spanish pronunciation. Machete. Machete. I Machete. I have La Llorona. I absolutely La love this film. Yes. It, <laughs> it, it is Robert Rodriguez firing on all cylinders. Danny Trejo coming into his own as a leading man. Yes. The the cast is over the top, over outrageous. The top. Yeah. Robert De, Robert De Niro, Jeff yeah. Fahey as the bad guy, <laughs> Lindsay Lohan. Mm -hmm. I, Steven Seagal. Yeah. <laughs> it, yes. It, it, it is so over the top. It is absolutely fantastic. I love this film no matter how over the top it goes. Yeah. Is this a movie where he cut open a guy's stomach and pulled his intestines out and used it as a rope to jump out a window? Correct, Amuno. <laughs> wow. That was it, right? <laughs> I buy that, that for a dollar. This all came about because they made the <laughs> fake trailers for a Grindhouse, uh, uh, Rodriguez and Tarantino, when they did Planet Terror and uh, Death Proof. They had some fake trailers, and one of them was Machete, and mm -hmm. Machete kills Machete. again. And so they decided to turn it into a real movie because it was, it was so popular for some reason. But yeah, it worked. It was funny. I love Grindhouse. I, 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 and the trailer, yeah, I, I was totally in. So, yeah, they had my yep. money. Of course, they lost my money when they cast Gibson in the sequel. So. There, oh, there it is. <laughs> well, number eight. This is interesting. It was a 2007 release. It just edged out Machete by 14.111 million, so just a few million mm. over. And this film was a film called Balls of Fury. And think what you want. Go ahead. <laughs> Balls of Fury, a ping pong movie, right? Correct. Yes. Wow. A sports comedy, if you will. <laughs> yeah, this is funny. Christopher Walken was so funny in this movie. He, mm. he played a, a guy named Fane. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he was the one who called, pronounced it ping pong. He, he just, the way he said it, it was like cracked me up every time. Yeah. <laughs> Dan Fogler, that was <laughs> the ping pong chat. Yeah, and then they had this uh, Maggie Q, uh, the Nikita the, from the Nikita series. She mm -hmm. played like a, she was like a female ping pong champion or something, or she was like a, I don't know, a spy or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, this movie was hilarious. It was, it was funny. Yeah, it, it made me laugh. Yeah, it, it, and Enter the Dragon uh, parody with sports it with sports. Yes, there. yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, right. What what was it? Uh, the guy from the state, Tom, uh, Tom Lennon. Tom um, playing the evil yeah. German. Yes, yes. And see, this was, and can you imagine the pitch for this? They're like, oh, no, hold on, hold on now. It's it's Labor Day weekend. People are going to be off. They need to see something funny. What's the craziest balls out of the wall thing? Wait a minute. Balls of Fury. Yep. What if we did a movie called Balls of Fury? <laughs> yeah, that would be it. That would be totally balls off the wall. Let's do that. Let's do that. Well, get... who, who would get in it, though? 
Christopher Walken. What's he doing? Nothing. What, what's he doing right about now? <laughs> I don't know, but I think he would be a prime candidate for Balls of Fury. Yeah, so let's do this. In your movie. <laughs> get George Lopez so we can get some Hispanic audience. In there. That's right. <laughs> George Lopez. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, I, but but they worked somehow. They said for Labor Day, this makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Number so seven, wild. number seven. Actually, this is the first horror. Of, and there's many horror films that come out. We're going to talk about that in just a second. This is a 2001 release that opened at 15 million, so it just topped both Balls of Fury and Machete, and that is Jeepers Creepers one, the first one. And well, what did you guys think of that in 2010? This I love a, Jeepers Creepers. Or classic. I mean, uh, how, uh, what's it? Justin Long plays the brother, and I can't remember the actress who plays the sister. Pretty girl. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a uh, creepy as hell, and it's. Uh, I know a lot of people. You're not supposed to like this movie because the director is a has been convicted of being a pedophile. Yes. But that doesn't take away the fact that the movie is a very effective. It's very uh, scary. It's intense. Mm -hmm. it's, pretty violent and yeah it's the, the performance of the movie and it's very simple it's basically a road movie everything takes place on a on a road and uh gas station and a house and that's it you know it's pretty bare bones but man it's oof and the creature is oh my god yeah yeah i, I appreciate guess they the, call creature him the creeper he drives around <laughs> in a big beat up truck you know mm -hmm. he's got a license plate that says eating you but it also means something else Mm. Be eating you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will be eating you. Oh man, and that ending is so bleak. Oh gosh. K Zach, yeah, did I you see this film? The, the Jeepers Creepers movies there's a franchise that I missed out on. So maybe I, maybe it's time to catch up. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been so long. I'm I'm trying to remember what, what my favorite scene was, but I can seem to remember that the costume design and the creature effects were were pretty scary. And I think some of the cinematography the way he shot some of the the scenes oh, where, yeah. where it seems like it's, it's super, very well super made. dark uh, but yeah Silva, the director uh, did a great well he, he's not cinematographer but yeah I'm, I'm sure he chose the guy he, yeah the way he wanted it to look and, and it does kind of have a kind of old school 70s film look to it sort of mm -hmm. uh, I mean it's very everything's very visually Nice. To, it's not like The Conjuring where everything's kind of muted colors yeah, or yeah. the way uh, that other director that did The Haunting of Hill, mm -hmm. Hill House, the way he shoots his films, everything's almost like blue and green. It's just very, very dull colors. But this is like, yeah, it's just everything's shot like, looks like it's shot on Kodak film. Yeah. It's really yeah. nice to look at. Yeah. The quality of this quality. film is one thing I do remember for sure. Let's look at number six. Number six is a movie that did open in 2010. It did 16 million, so it just did a million better than, than uh, Jeepers Creepers there. And it was called The American, starring George Clooney. So what do you remember about that film? Uh, George Clooney is the, an assassin, but in this movie he's like in Europe in an Italian, small Italian village. Mm -hmm. And a female assassin hires him to build a rifle for her a mm -hmm. gun that she could use and uh it's very old like it kind of reminded me of those old european films uh it's it's also kind of like a very bare movie where there's not a lot of a lot happening but the way it's acted and performed and the scenery i mean this italian village man i wanted to go and live there it's mm. like man i'd love to just disappear in a place like this where everybody knows everybody and, and it's just beautiful countryside <laughs> yeah he takes this girl on a picnic to go test the rifle out and uh, <laughs> it, it's a great it's a great scene and it builds a little tension yeah and at the end there's a little tension and then there's and then it, it's an adult movie it has a, a really erotic sex scene for me that i that you don't usually see in movies nowadays where he finds this girl this beautiful italian prostitute and they have sex and man, it's man is like a beautifully shot scene. And yeah, she was oof. Yeah. Craziness, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the American, <laughs> that's right. The well, American. Yeah. The American. But yeah, one of a uh, very understated uh performance by Clooney. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought he was mm -hmm. great in this. He's very uh, matter of fact about everything. He's very uh meticulous about his craft and mm -hmm. what he does and 
Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I thought he sold it pretty well because I don't really usually see George Clooney as that guy. I always see him as some sort of a James Bond type of guy in a way, the American Mm -hmm. version of James Bond, if you will. Very charming, like the uh, Ocean's 13 movies, you know, Mm -hmm. he's just very cavalier, you know. Yeah. Uh, Charming. Yeah, yeah, he's this just, movie, yeah, it was, it he's just that him, he's sure. that guy that you know when you're married, your wife looks at you and go, "If I get a hall pass, George Clooney, huh, <laughs> huh, huh, George Clooney, <laughs> yeah, right? 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 right, right? If I get a hall pass, <laughs> right, right?" And you go, uh, "Well, if that's the case, Charlize Theron, what do you think?" Uh, right, no. So anyway, that's the guy that creates those kind of conversations. <laughs> let's look at yeah. let's look at number five. Here we now are going to the top five movies that were released at the best opening weekend on that Labor Day release date. And this movie is a sequel to Jeepers Creepers. It's Jeepers Creepers three. I'm sorry, two in 2003 and it did better way better than its original predecessor at that same time and it did 18.3 million so i guess they were doing their statistics and they said all right we need to do another jeepers creepers because it did well last time let's open it in the same weekend and they were right it made more money so what do you remember about this one carlos jeepers creepers 2 is actually a prequel to jeepers creepers it takes place like in that's right the 60s or something where there's a bus full of high school kids coming back from a track meet and uh, (laughs) a bus breaks down and there you have it spam in a can for the creeper who just basically picks them off one by one yeah Yeah, there's some very effective scenes in that one of the (laughs) grossest was where he's in the back window looking in at all these kids and all these kids are freaked out and he's just like takes his tongue down and starts licking the window. And uh, it's just gross. Uh, See, now we know something in this. But it gives you a little bit more mythology of the creeper himself. And uh, and then this guy ends up coming that's hunting the creeper. You know? Yeah, and it's it sh- this big harpoon <laughs> <laughs> mounted on a truck. Yeah, right? Like, oh, my goodness. Well, this is, it shows that's, you something. Uh, that was Leland from uh, uh, Twin Peaks, the yeah. uh, murderer of uh, wow. Laura Palmer. Mm. Yeah, he plays that guy. (laughs) See, and that's bad. That shows you right there that that whole that high school did not pick did not know how to pick a track team. Because if I'm if I'm on a track team, and your Jeepers Creepers coming, I'm gone. You ain't catching me. You better be in a Corvette to catch me. You know, if I'm on a track team and I get scared, I'm out of there. So, (laughs) and you know what? There's actually you know how how it's uh, how it's kind of a cliche in horror movies. The black guy always gets killed first. Yeah, and this one, the black guy is like the hero. He actually, I think he lands ends up till the end. I can't. It's been a while since I've watched it. Yeah, he he ends up alive at the end. Oh, how about that? See. Track team, I guess, I guess, I guess. Now, here's an interesting one. At number four, we actually have a semi-documentary of something nobody really probably cares about. Uh, it came out in 2013. It did 18.4 million, so it just edged out Jeepers Creepers 2 at that time. And it was a movie called One Direction, This Is Us, the documentary about that boy band. So I have nothing. <laughs> I have nothing here. I didn't see it. I know of One Direction. It's a very huge, popular British boy band. Yeah, it pretty much goes. The to only show thing you I can tell you is. about the 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 band the band itself is one of the actors or one of the members of the band ended up in uh, that uh, Nolan movie Dunkirk, and it turned out the kid's That's right. not a bad actor. That's right. He, he's very British, so he he was perfect for that role. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, he was the guy that did the Wilhelm scream and then fell over once he got shot, right? That was him? No. <laughs> <laughs> He's known for his hair. Now, he, Kay, Zach, he, I, I got... It realistic because that kid would have been like close crop hair, you know, soldiers back then. But now he still had that big of hair. Now, Kay, Zach, I... I cut it. I gotta imagine, Kay, Zach, that, that One Direction must be like a, a boy band of Kevin Costner's to you. Is that true? <laughs> I, all I can say is what now? <laughs> Ooh, what? It's what? another way to torture Kazak. Just make him watch one, this documentary. One direction. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to happen. See there? Dang it. I love the subtitle. This is a, yeah, no shit. This is you. Right? <laughs> it this just goes not. to show you exactly what this okay. weekend is. Basically, it, it, it drags the parents out. Uh, on a school weekend to go see a movie. That's, yes. And pretty much, you know, it's fairly safe because, again, it is going to be a boy band for teeny boppers. So, yeah. 
It was a safe movie to dump kids off for two hours. Mm. That's, mm-hmm. why, that's why I make so much money. Yep. Yes, that's true. And number three, we have a different film. We're going to go back to the action genre here. This one came out in 2005, and it actually opened at 20 mil. So that's why it's up here at three. And this is Transporter 2. Not the first one, <laughs> but the second one, yes. They hit the right numbers here, I guess, by putting it on Labor Day weekend. Anybody see this movie? I've seen the original Transporter. I can't remember if I've seen Transporter 2. I know I haven't seen 3 because they're basically the same movie over and over again. It's just more of Statham yep. driving real fast and getting from one point to another and fighting and kicking doors down and beating up people and smashing trash. Yeah. Yeah, I think Transporter. I think this series was the litmus test for them to add him to Fast and the Furious one day. They just said, hey, what can we do to liven this up? We already got Wonder Woman in one of our issues of Fast and the Furious. <laughs> hey, what about this one guy? He did this thing called Transporter. That's fast. That's furious, right? Let's put him in there. He knows, yeah. he knows how to drive. <laughs> yeah, he knows how to drive. He'd be a great stick. addition. We got it. <laughs> and now he gets to be in Calvin and Hobbes. So here you go, folks. Transporter. Oh, <laughs> So number two, now what we're about to do, the last two here are horror films, and there's four horror films that have dominated this list. Number two is The Possession. It came out in 2012, and it opened at 21 million. The Possession. You remember this one, Carlos? I don't. I don't think I've seen this. Uh, It sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. I know uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan was in it. Mm Mm-hmm. But I couldn't tell you the plot or anything about it, the possession. Yeah. There's so many movies with possession, depossession, and mm-hmm. uh, but they're mm-hmm. all kind of confusing. But uh, no, I, I don't think I've seen this one, actually. Yeah. Sounds interesting. Yeah. You know what? It was an okay film. I, I barely remember it. I saw it once, and that was enough. It was one of those films where if you saw it once, it was enough because I think the tropes were pretty heavy in terms of the supernatural being the evil all the time. And so at some point, you you know, you picked up references of, okay, I know where they got that film from. That That's Damon Omen right there, and that's this. I mean, it, it was fine, um, but I never really – I mean, Kazak, did you see this film? No, pose- possession films really have done nothing for me. I mean, I uh, – I mean, th- this you've is going to sound. Th- this yeah. is going to sound like blasphemy, right. but e- even The Exorcist has never really done anything. <gasps> what? Oh, outrage! Blasphemy. Outrage! It, 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 uh, Linda Blair puts on a fine performance, and there are wonderfully creepy moments. But yeah, just one possession film. I've seen them all. There it is. And mm-hmm. that's it. And so now let's get to the number one. We can spend some time on this because it is a favorite of a bunch of us. A 2007 release. It opened at 30 million. It is the number one. It has the record still of the top release during Labor Day. It is Rob Zombie's Halloween. <laughs> That's amazing that this movie made 30 million. Well, not not really surprising, but uh, that's that's got to be Rob Zombie's most like biggest blockbuster, right? Like mm-hmm. all his other movies can't compare to to this. Um, yeah. Devil's Rejects and 31 and all those movies, but but he was taking on a well-known, you know, uh, re, it was a remake, you know, of, mm-hmm. of the original Carpenter film, of course, mm-hmm. but he did a, his own kind of little spin on it, made it very visually, to me, it was pretty visually amazing to look at. Uh, uh-huh. Malcolm McDowell, great as Dr. Loomis, right? right. And uh, I can't remember who played Laurie Strode. Um, Oh yeah, gosh, I know who you're talking about too. Uh, Scout, Scout Compton Taylor, or something. Yeah, Scout yeah, Taylor, Taylor Compton. Compton. Mm-hmm. Scout. Uh, that, uh, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I dig this film. I, I thought Rob Zombie did something really unique with it. He didn't just remake, you know, like a shot for shot of the original. He he put his own uh, his visuals and ideas into it. I thought it was very effective, very uh, violent as hell. Yeah, and I didn't use, wasn't the guy who played Michael Myers, wasn't that a wrestler? Yes, Tyler Bain. That's right, Tyler uh, Bain. You, you might know him better as Sabretooth from the original X-Men movie. There it is, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and this guy's stature, and what I liked about what Zombie did here is he decided to kind of give us some clues into maybe the pathology of how Michael Myers could do that with his idea of killing animals first. 
before he moved mm -hmm. on to people. And I thought that was pretty interesting that he tried to give it a little bit of some some sort of emotional weight too, not just here's another slasher film. So I thought that was a yeah. pretty good take. Some mindless psychopath, you know, that you, he's just like a cypher, you know, you know nothing about you. In, in the Carpenter film, the Michael Myers film, you just know he was saw something as a kid and it traumatized him and he spent his whole life in an institution and then he breaks up. And from then on, he's almost like a, like a golem, you know, he's just a mindless killing machine. But this one, yeah, he, he gives him a little backstory. And, mm. uh, yeah, yeah. I, I remember the, the kid, there was a shot of the kid. He had this long blonde hair mm. uh, and, he, and he had that mask, you know, on top of his head. Mm. It was like a, was it a clown outfit, like a clown costume? Yes, it was a clown yes. mask. Right, right. So, yeah. yeah, it was. was now we never, we never got the production total on it, but the film went on to net out at about fifty-eight million as its gross, and so wow. I imagine since it was a horror film, I can't imagine that budget being budget being over fourteen million. So if yeah. that's if that's true then to do almost 60 million as a domestic gross, that was definitely a hit well, for I mean, Mr. The, Zombie. Well, I mean, this, I think, is them giving Rob Zombie money because, uh, you know, Devil's Rejects, House of a Thousand Corpses did well. They were going to give him money to do mm -hmm. uh, a franchise film, and that's what they were hoping for. And the marketing campaign worked. Um, it got kids in the theaters. It got people in the theaters. It, uh, I remember watching this film and getting motion sick. On the mm. on the big screen because the, really? the the sound is over the top, the shaky camera is over the top. It really by the end makes you physically ill the first time you see it because everything is just way over sen uh, way sensory overload. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, zombie, like I said, I, I th this is his highest grossing film, but you'll see how the totals fell off for Halloween too, and it just it I think it it. Got some folks excited about the film, but once they saw it, I think they became disappointed, disenchanted with a lot of what Zombie yeah. was doing. Uh, Definitely not as strong as the first one. Uh, yeah, for I, sure. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. I didn't care for it. I, I barely remember. I only watched it one time, and yeah, that was enough. So I, I thought, yeah, I'm not going to watch this again. This is just not that, that good. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen it a couple times. I've seen it a couple times uh, just because I really do like the. Uh, pathology that they work into the kid. Mm -hmm. um, I, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, over the the whole thing is just so over the top. And once they get into the sequel, it gets really terrible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He he went on with that film. It and it's funny because the worldwide release didn't do nearly as well as it did here. So it only did twenty million uh, internationally. So. It ended up making wow. the total about 80 million worldwide total at the end of that, which is not bad for a horror film. So yeah, it was he was definitely an interesting take on it. And plus the Halloween fans, like you know, there's a lot of people you can piss off if you don't do this film right, you know, who just love mm -hmm. the original Carpenter one, right? Yeah. Oh, and there's some that really hate it. Yeah, they they hate they hate Rob Zombie for one, and then they hate what he did with Halloween. Yeah. To them, the the original ha Halloween is just like this holy scripture and they can't see anything other than that and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 a fine film it's a it's a b movie mm -hmm. i mean it's not anything more than a b movie for Very me much. you know uh the carpenter film i love Car rob uh john carpenter mm -hmm. but his movies are not like super high quality as far as you know the, the you know the the production value and stuff mm -hmm. is no, yeah, he's, it's very genuine. He's low budget and loves it. That's that's the appeal. Yeah, of, yeah. That's appeal to John the, Carpenter. That's the appeal to it for me as well. Is, is the charm of the low budget filmmaking. I, I like those kind of movies. Mm -hmm. and it's great, but some people act like these are like high cinematic art. Here. No, no. Well, for well, for, well, for horror <laughs> fan, for horror <laughs> fans, especially uh, especially for a franchise as storied as Halloween. Uh, you really needed to do it right, and it it, it kind of goes to show you why uh, the latest Halloween opened so big because mm -hmm. you were going back to uh, original tropes, you were going back to the original heroine, uh, you uh, you're also getting, of course, uh, the original shape, Michael Myers, uh, mm -hmm. coming back in and basically doing what the Halloween franchise needed to do was you know a small cast, yeah. uh, s small cast, small budget. You know, just m unstoppable maniac killing people. <laughs> That's what you do because you don't need the sensory overload. You don't need the shaky camera. You don't need it mm -hmm. to do a good monster film. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Zo- yep. And and the and the hatred for zombie is palatable. It really, yeah. really is. Yeah, there are some people who are definitely there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, just like that, that's another episode. We actually want to give some shout outs. So, Carlos, who do you want to give a shout out to that maybe you've been interacting with? Shout out to uh, Mad Mel, mm-hmm. my buddy. Absolutely. Happy. <laughs> all right, Mad Mel. <laughs> my, uh, let me, also, my son, he's been watching all the episodes. Uh, Matt, he's in uh, San Marcos now. I saw him yesterday. And uh, yeah, he enjoys all the shows. And, uh, Awesome. Yeah, he discovers movies that he's never heard of. Said, yeah, I heard about you talking about that. I definitely want to go see this movie. So. That's nice. Pre- nice yeah, to meet that's you, man. Good. I like to turn people on to, to stuff. Absolutely. And I will say a big shout out to uh, Stephanie Crane still and also uh, Michael Paul, who's been basically watching all these once the, uh, he watches them once we post them. So big shout out to Michael Paul. He's really enjoyed some of our conversations about this as well. And actually, most of the conversations he says. That's pretty good. Uh, so let's do this. Let's talk about what's going to happen next, and then everybody will give you their contacts and their sign names that you can find them if you want to talk to them uh, post-show. Um, September 8th is when we come back next. That will be right after Labor Day weekend. And as you guys will know or have followed, if you watch movies, you know that September is Halloween month pretty much because that's when all the mo- movies come out so that they're already in the theater by the time October 31st comes. So what we thought we would do is next episode, we're going to have a horror feature. So if you're a horror fan and, or you have a bunch of friends who are horror fans, tell them they need to be watching this next episode, because we're going to dive into horror and we're going to have a special guest if I can get him on Horror Mike. And this guy, he eats horror films like chiclets. This is what he does. And so, mm. uh, but that means nothing to you if you don't eat chiclets. So, but, uh, but yes, um, <laughs> we'll try to get him on because he has a lot on that. So, Carlos, where can they find the film Samurai? They can find the film Samurai on Twitter and Facebook. That's right. And K Zach, how can they find you? You can find me here every Sunday here on DallasOnAir.com for Talk Nerdy to Me Sunday. You can find me on the Rancor Pit. You can find me on uh, Figments. You can find me on uh, 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 Isle of Toys. And, of course, you can find me here and on the show coming up next, The Vortex of Doom, right here on DallasOnAir.com. That's right. And you guys can find me on Facebook, same name, Vega Bomber, Twitter, Vega Bomber, YouTube, the Vega Bomber channel. Go ahead, and that's how you can figure out and watch some of these shows if you didn't catch it live today. It's there as well. And Instagram, also under Vega Bomber. So uh, that's been it for us this week. We will look forward to seeing you next week and be ready to start thinking about things of creepy note because we're going to go there. The best we'll time of the year, Halloween. That's it. We'll see you. Sayonara. This is DallasOnAir.com.